They will hit the Russian economy hard. Tonight, Russia is feeling the shock of Western sanctions. Most of those are linked to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. They intensified with Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. Russia's burning, and this time, I mean economically. In fact, one Russian oligarch, Oleg Deripaska, has now publicly said there will be no money already next year. Russia needs foreign investors. As things continue to get worse on the war front for Russia, with the international sanctions taking their toll, Russian banks are facing heavy challenges of having to deal with the effect of a falling ruble. If things continue to go this way, Russian banks are going to be forced to sell assets at reduced prices to meet demand from depositors wanting their money back. The current discrepancy between foreign currency on hand versus deposits owed is at an unprecedented $46 billion to $280 billion. Worse yet, it seems Russia's faithful ally, China, has ordered its banks to stop doing business with Russian counterparts. On top of just pausing business, Chinese banks are also withholding payments that are owed to Russian businesses. This has poured gasoline on the fire that was the fall of the Russian banks and economy. So in this video, we'll discuss why Russian banks are failing, the economic effects of sanctions, and why Chinese banks have left Russia high and dry in their time of need. If you're ever struggling to find some of our videos, it's because the YouTube algorithm and Putin's bots don't want you to see them. Our content is a bit daring, so we aren't really popular with everybody. To keep us afloat, please give this video a like and help us push our content out. Now, let's get into today's topic. To start, the failing bank system is not good for Russians who store their savings in foreign currency. The Institute of International Finance estimates 21% of Russian deposits are held in foreign currencies, and this means that soon people will be scrambling to get their money out of the banks as the financial sector becomes unstable. In response to the sanctions, the central bank has had to order Russian companies to sell dollars they earned from foreign business transactions to boost the supply of foreign currencies in the banks. From here, there's likely to be a rise in bad loans and an imposition of deposit withdrawal limits. The group that suffers the most from this is Russian businesses, which are going to be working overtime to repay foreign debts as the exchange rate worsens. The first signs that the banking system was crashing came in 2023, when Russia's biggest bank, Sparebank, reported a nearly 80% plunge from 2022. The bank's annual profit came up to 270.5 billion rubles, which is about $3.57 billion. This figure was $396 million lower than what was reported in the previous year. The CEO of the bank, Jeremy Greff, called 2023 the most difficult year, and many banks had to limit disclosures and dividend payments to maintain stability. The bank had to implement an anti-crisis plan, with Greff stating, We implemented an anti-crisis plan. We radically revised our priorities, introduced the strictest savings measures, closed and sold international businesses, and also made the necessary provisions for the loan portfolio and blocked assets. Other lenders like Bank VTB have suffered too, and as commercial banks scramble for profits, Russia's central bank anticipates there will be systematic risks. Banks are now focusing their business prospects and turning to the state for contracts, especially in the area of defense, where most of Russia's money is going. Russian billionaire Oleg Deripaska, who's very outspoken about his feelings towards the war, forecasted that there would be no money in 2024. Speaking at an economic conference in Siberia, he stated, There will be no money already next year. We need foreign investors. Deraspaka has not been afraid to call out Putin on what's happening in Ukraine, as he feels like the spending in Ukraine is sinking Russia's economy. His prediction was right, and the forecast for 2024 is not looking good for banks either. Dmitry Pyanov, who's the CFO for VTB, which is the second largest bank in Russia, said, there's a clear understanding that banking sector profits in 2024 will be seriously lower than in 2023. This is because consecutive interest rate hikes have seriously damaged Russian banks' prospects, and they're anticipating a drop in the sector's profits. The central bank has mercilessly jacked up interest rates to 13% to try to handle inflationary pressures, labor shortages, and a wide budget deficit. Pyanov told reporters, we have about 15 billion rubles of falling interest income per one percentage point increase in the key rate. In this situation, you can calculate what kind of falling income we'll have. Up till this point, Russia has been relying on the yuan, but with reports of a yuan liquidity deficit, they're in trouble. Now, before we get into that, I quickly wanted to answer a question I recently got asked. 
A lot of you guys want to start a YouTube channel, but you're camera shy or just not comfortable putting your face out there. In fact, I'm one of those people, and that's why this channel has no face on it. Luckily, you can still grow on YouTube even without showing your face or giving up your privacy. This channel's the living proof of that. In fact, here are just a few examples of channels that started in the last 12 months and grew an audience without showing their face. They've gotten millions of views and made thousands of dollars from them. We recently crossed 1 million subscribers, and along the way, we've learned a few tips and tricks about YouTube that can be very helpful to any of you who want to start your channel. We've included all this in my completely free 7-day YouTube crash bootcamp. So if you're someone who's interested in starting a YouTube channel, this is the perfect starting point for you. What better way to convince you than to read a comment left by a previous student? This free bootcamp's better than a paid course he took. So if you're interested in signing up, you can sign up now for free by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. The Yuan had become the most traded foreign currency on the Moscow Stock Exchange, MOEX, after the Western sanctions, as everybody else had refused to trade with Russia. The deficit in liquidity of the Yuan has come because China's refused to be paid in rubles and will only receive the Yuan as payments. This makes sense as the value of the ruble is volatile in the global market. Unfortunately, as the ruble continues to plunge, Russian banks are faced with a big problem. Reports from September show that the ruble fell by almost 5% against the yuan. More data from MOEX predicts that the central bank's daily yuan sales will rise to $200 million. As the situation gets out of hand, banks like Sparebank are now calling on the central bank to take action. The bank's CEO, Greff, said, we cannot lend the yuan because we have nothing to cover our foreign currency positions with. Due to these foreign currency shortages, Russian businesses have been forced to depend on yuan swap deals provided by the Bank of Russia, but this happens at ridiculously high rates. Swap deals are financial agreements between parties that are meant to help manage risk. In these deals, one party, in this case Russian businesses, pay a premium to the other party, which compensates them for the risk of the financial transaction. In the first months of 2024, swap deals were being done at about 2.4 billion yuan on average. In June, when the US increased its threats about secondary sanctions, there was a frightening jump to 10.3 billion yuan, with the figure coming down a little in July to 6.5 billion. August has reported the worst numbers, with the figure jumping to 20 billion. If this continues, Russia will not have enough currency to be able to make any of their payments. The situation is only going to get worse as Russian businesses report that there have been growing delays in payments with Chinese trading partners, with billions of yuan being withheld for months on end. This is because Chinese state banks are closing transactions with Russia in mass numbers and withholding payments to them. Financial institutions in China that were previously making payments to and for Russia have been scrutinizing the transactions heavily, and now payments that are flagged are being held back in Chinese state banks. This means that Russian businesses that make their money through oil and gas exports are suffering the most. The situation intensified in August, when Chinese state banks carried out a mass shutdown of Russian transactions worth billions of yuan. A source in Russian business reported on the situation, stating, At that moment, all cross-border payments to China stopped. We found solutions, but it took about three weeks, which is a very long time. Trade volumes fell drastically during that time. Russian businesses have had to turn to other countries for help, but this has been extremely expensive. The other alternative has been trying to use smaller Chinese banks for trading under different company names. One source stated that they were buying gold and moving it to Hong Kong to sell it there through middlemen. These side door transactions mean that Russian businesses have to use chains of intermediaries in third countries to handle their transactions and run them through Chinese banks. This method also comes at a cost, and transactions have risen to 6%. Some of you may be wondering why China's doing this to its biggest ally. In the world of geopolitics, China and Russia have had each other's back. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and the West brought heavy sanctions against it, China became its biggest economic partner. China's been Russia's largest trading partner, making up a third of Russia's foreign trade in 2023. Bilateral trade between Russia and China grew by 1.6% to $137 billion in the first half of 2024, after hitting a record high of $240 billion in 2023. 
The country supplied Russia with vital industrial equipment and consumer goods throughout the war, and this has kept Russia afloat. When everyone turned their back on Russia again in 2022, China was right there beside it to help it weather the storm of Western sanctions. Unfortunately, conditions are changing, and the time has come for China to start thinking about itself as well. The US has warned them that if they're found to be dealing with Russian businesses who are on the sanctions list, they'll be hit with the same sanctions. These sanctions are known as secondary sanctions, and they'll be placed on China for indirectly helping the war effort. By allowing money to be paid to Russian companies, the West believes that China is working as a facilitator, which frustrates the aim of the Western sanctions. Chinese businesses have to think about themselves as well, and protecting their personal interests means taking these threats made by Washington seriously. Large companies in China rely on the American and European markets for trade, and if they want to keep afloat, they need to forget about their friendship with Russia. There are currently 265 Chinese companies on the U.S. stock exchange, with a total market of $848 billion. This means that China has a lot to lose if it keeps helping Russia out. Dmitry Berachevsky, head of the economic department at Russia's foreign ministry, commented on this at a conference in Moscow in August, saying, And they're being told, guys, if you continue to work with Russia, we'll cut off your access to our market and choke off your oxygen supply. As Chinese banks have tightened compliance, Russia's imports from China have fallen more than 1% to $62 billion in the first half of 2024. Russia's central bank forecasts that the country's total imports globally will fall as far as 3% this year. The central bank blames the decrease in imports on the strengthening of the sanctions barriers related to payments and logistics. In the beginning, the Kremlin underplayed the damage that the sanctions were causing, but now we're watching as an economic crisis unfolds in Russia. In a speech to Russia's parliament, Putin boastfully stated that the Russian economy and system of government have turned out to be much stronger than the West believed. In the year after he made these comments, the Russian government's revenue plunged by 35%, while expenditures jumped 59%. This led to a budget deficit of about $23.3 billion. Western countries have imposed sanctions in Russia as a way of starving the funds Russia was using to fuel its invasion of Ukraine. Since February 2022, Western countries have announced more than 11,300 sanctions and have frozen some $300 billion of Russia's foreign reserves. In recent months, the UK has also imposed new bans on Russian metal, diamond, and energy exports. The EU has also announced the sanctions of 200 organizations and people that it's identified helping Russians acquire weapons. These sanctions also include companies that have participated in shipping North Korean weapons to Russia. Sanctions have also dealt deadly blows to Russia's import market, as there's been a ban on exports of technology that Russia might need for military use. The West has taken these sanctions very seriously and banned imports of gold and diamond. Certain airlines have even stopped flights from Russia in a bid to isolate the country. Russian oligarchs have also been sanctioned with their overseas assets being frozen and some of their yachts being impounded as well. As if this isn't enough, multinational companies like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, and Heineken have also stopped selling and making goods in Russia and sold all their locations in Russia back to the government. Clothing companies like H&M, Zara, and Diesel have paused all their sales in Russia, as most international brands have chosen to side with the West. Although the Kremlin claims that it's not been affected by these changes, U.S. Treasury claims sanctions have cut 5% from the economic growth that Russia would have experienced in the past two years. The sanctions have different sectors with different levels of severity. We'll start with oil production, which is a big part of Russia's economy. Before sanctions, Russia was the world's third largest oil producer, with a 12% oil market. Russia's three biggest export destinations used to be Europe, China, and Turkey. Things changed at the end of 2022 when a majority of Russian crude oil exports to Europe were banned. For countries like China and India who are still choosing to do business with Russia, the new price cap has been placed at $60 a barrel, which is below the global benchmark of $82. Currently, a barrel of Ural's crude oil, Russia's main blend of oil, has fallen to an estimated $49.50 per barrel, which is way below the price cap set. This is because customers like China and India have taken advantage of the sanctions and negotiated for lower prices. Next, we turn to Russia's automotive industry, which has been severely affected by the sanctions. Volkswagen, Renault, Ford, and Nissan have all halted production in Russia and sold their assets to the government and Chinese firms. 
According to the Association of European Businesses, the sales of new cars in Russia have dropped by 63%. As a case study, we can take a look at Russian carmaker Avtovaz that has been placed on the U.S. Specially Designated Nationals and Blocked Persons List, or SDN list. The sanctions on the business have been detrimental for its export of Russian vehicles to the global market. In a bid to save the business, Avtovaz decided to relaunch production by partnering with Chinese companies to manufacture vehicles. Unfortunately, these partnerships are probably going to break down soon because of the secondary sanctions that will be imposed on Chinese companies that trade with sanctioned businesses. This means that Russian car-making businesses like Avtovaz are going to be out of business soon. All of the issues with importing and exporting brand new vehicles has meant that the second-hand car market's booming. Autostat CEO Sergei Udalov told Reuters, Budget Ladas and Chinese cars with prices of 2 million rubles and more remain in it, while premium brands have almost completely left. What's even sadder is that Russia can't even turn to its closest ally, China, during this automotive crisis. The payment issues between Russia and China caused by the US sanctions mean that Russian importers of Chinese cars have been losing out on big business. China's also not been sitting back while all of this misfortune's been happening. They've taken over Russia's car market and begun to sell since companies like Nissan and Renault have pulled out. This may be beneficial for China, but with no car production happening in Russia, Moscow's getting the short end of the deal. Another market that's experiencing major losses is the mineral market. Sanctions have been placed on the export of precious metals, such as diamonds, gold, and steel. Companies like Nornickel, which is the world's largest producer of refined nickel and palladium, stated that the sanctions have been affecting their ability to push their metals. The numerous difficulties with cross-border payments have meant profits have been lower than ever before. The U.S. has placed sanctions on the company's copper units and other affiliates that provide services to Russian miners. The technology industry in Russia has also been affected by the sanctions. The restrictions imposed on exports of high-technology goods have increased as the West tries to weaken Russian production capacity. Russian citizens are also no longer able to enjoy their favorite technology products as the imports of many famous gadgets have fallen too. Non-sanctioning countries have tried to come to Russia's rescue, but there's no substitute for well-known and established brands like Apple and Samsung, as these two companies have halted their shipments to Russia. China and Turkey's technology imports into Russia have exceeded pre-war level and Kazakhstan has also stepped in. But their imports are not enough to meet the gaping hole that's been left. The United States has also gone as far as to hit Russia with sanctions on software and information technology services. This ban limits the provision of IT services and support to any person in the Russian Federation, but also applies to countries that trade with Russia. The goal of these restrictions is to limit the ability that Russian military industrial bases have to take advantage of certain U.S. software and services. By placing these restrictions, the U.S. has disrupted the Russian military industrial base's reliance on foreign IT systems. This is a decisive blow, because most of Russia's major software companies are based in the U.S. This ban will also impact Russia's access to software such as business intelligence or computer-aided design. Under the circumstances, Russia's ability to keep its economy afloat till now is very impressive. Russia managed to pivot from being the largest exporter of commodities in Europe to selling to China and India in a short space of time. The change was costly, but it managed to leverage what it had to keep things going. The thing about sanctions is it takes some time for them to kick in. But once they do, their impact is undeniable. In every sector of the Russian economy, we can see the damage that the sanctions from the West have done. As more money is pumped into the war effort, the coffers are drying out. Russian banks are feeling the heat the most currently, and we'll just have to wait and see how this all plays out.